Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today and uh, making time to discover what this is all about, the Art of Effective Meetings. So this is a course that is designed by um, CIMAX, which is a training division of VUMA Collaborations. Um, before we begin, I just want to thank uh, Camilla and the team of Saeem for organizing this and for letting us be a part of this. Um, this morning, I am not alone. Um, I will be doing this course with Connie Chijara as my facilitate, uh, co-facilitator. My name is Mpo Palwane. I will be your main facilitator for the session. Um, I am a business scientist here at Voma Collaboration and also head of operations for our training uh, department, uh, CIMEX. And just before we begin, I just want to highlight the word facilitator that we use for this course. We did not use teacher or lecturer or trainer. Uh, we deliberately use the word facilitator and you will hear as we begin that this course is mainly about that role and that that is the key ingredient into making um, meetings effective and other group communications uh, in an organization and even in life. So before we get into it, I just want to play us a little video that will um, sensitize us and frame our reference as to what this few hours uh, that we're going to be together are going to be about. I hey, I was on this date the other night and um... We were at this restaurant. All right, guys, you guys ready to get started? Hang on a second. And Trip, you ready to get started, buddy? Okay. Hey, you guys, we're all here. We should start. Hey, I was on this date the other night, and... Um, we were at this restaurant. All right, guys, you guys ready to get started? Hang on a second. And Trip, you ready to get started, buddy? Okay. Hey, you guys, we're all here. We should start. All right. Uh, thanks for coming, guys. I just wanted to take a few minutes and talk about some ideas for the marketing strategy this year. So if you got one, just throw it out there. I'd love to hear. Them. Yeah. Um, how long is this meeting supposed to last? The schedule wasn't exactly clear. Should be out of here in 30. Is that approximate or? Hey guys, sorry I'm a couple minutes late. I got caught in traffic. Seven minutes actually. What's that? A couple is two. Uh, so what we're doing is we're just coming up with some ideas for our new marketing strategy. Sure. So, anyone? I think we should implement Pinterest. Ooh, that's a fun idea. What about a publicity event in the park? Interesting, but how are you gonna plan around the weather? What if it rains? So we'll party in the rain. Okay, just want to emphasize there's no bad ideas here. We're just brainstorming. So. Yeah, I'm just really thinking it'll be a huge waste of money to try to plan around the weather. Yeah, okay, we get your concerns. Nancy, thank you. Okay, um, anyone else have an idea? Ephraim. I've always wanted to see rain fall down all at once in a big splash instead of small drops over time. I mean, think how it could impact the irrigation system. Okay. Um, Terry? Well, um, I have an idea from my previous job that I had last year. But, um, let me take that back a little bit. I have this wonderful idea, but it doesn't really make sense unless I just take it back a second and bring it forward together. It was like three weeks ago that I remember oh. he said whoa, something whoa, whoa, whoa. that I couldn't understand. Hold on a second, uh, Terry. Hold on. Thanks for pointing. Here's what we need to do. Okay. Uh, Lauren, you got this? We do a video submission contest on YouTube. Oh, okay. that's been done. It'll be on Facebook, it'll be on Pinterest, it'll be on Twitter. If we do something with technology, we lose the senior demographic. So, uh, you guys want to see an example? Should we be moving on to the next topic? I mean, uh, it's already quarter after. Ha! Quarter after. That's funny. Uh, who knows how to put this on the screen? Up there, because you're not going to be able to... I want you to see all the details. We have a cable. Does this cable work? I think that's a 
And it's power. Uh, I don't know if on the TV, there's an this HDMI one. port. The cord's not going to be long enough. In the back, Is that remote go to like the two or three, TV? Like HDMI one. Plenty of time, guys. Two, no rush. HDMI this isn't three, working. I got a green marker. And call the IT guy. With, uh, Wait, there's turn also, what off and oh, back on? what do you call the S-video? Hello? Okay, I've got it working. Hit play. <laughs> okay, now imagine hundreds of those floating around the web. You actually, do you want to watch it one more time? No, please. Trip, I think you're onto something with this idea. I really like it. Carol, did you get that down? Yeah, got it. Sorry, what is C test up sub YT pros? Well, I'm abbreviating to make room for all these great ideas. Contest, uploading it to YouTube, funniest, and you get a prize. Wait, where are the other ideas? Oh. And time. Wait, where y'all going? Uh, we still have 100% of the things to accomplish. Okay, um, so with that intro, um, we will get a little bit more into the details now. And we're going to do a bit of a, an activity um, to discuss um, why um, you decided to attend this course. Um, and also uh, separately on another slide, you also see, uh, we're gonna use a, an online app called Menti. And then on the next one, you're going to tell us a an interesting thing about yourself. This is so that we can get to know each other a little bit more. So just starting with the first one, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna ask you um, to go to menti.com. and answer this question. So tell us, you know, why did you decide to come to this course? Why did you choose to um, register for the art of effective meetings? What was it about it that intrigued you, interested you? Uh, so when you go to menti.com, then you enter that code, you will see once you get there, whether it's on your phone or it's on your computer, um, it will ask you for that code, the 252, 5818, and then you will have space to just enter your comments. Um, this is how we keep the session interactive. This is how we get feedback from you. We're going to use this tool throughout the course of the training to give you um, a voice, um, which is another thing that I'm hoping you're going to pick up about the difference between when we're facilitating and when we're lecturing or when we're training. Uh, because we want you to be part of uh, the learning process and the teaching process as well. Um, if you have any trouble, you can just throw it in the chat box there and let us know what you're struggling with. But you go to menti.com, www.menti.com, and then you put in that code and then tell us uh, the answer. What um, made you decide to register for this course and what are you hoping to get out of it? You can give more than one answer, absolutely. Is everyone able to log into Menti? If you're struggling, please let us know. Hmm. 
Okay, wonderful. We already have one answer there. Uh, someone says they want to learn how to be assertive in meetings. And then the other one says they want to know how to lead and conduct meeting accordingly. Um, another one is they would like to be a stronger facilitator, guide the team more in the direction of the agenda and outcomes that need to be achieved. Um, another answer is learn how to run effective meetings. Yes, that's what this uh, course is all about. Um, can we have a couple more just to get an idea of why uh, everybody decided to enroll and register for this course? Oh yeah, and I like this one. Like you have, like all of us attended a lot of meetings where you were either chair or participating. So you want to, you know, see if there are any gaps, uh, if there are any learning opportunities, uh, any opportunity to grow. I like that, to be able to facilitate a meeting and transcribe minutes effectively, uh, to conduct and lead meetings. <clears throat> We're just gonna give it a few more minutes for more people to just uh, put in their thoughts or even think a little bit about what intrigued them about this course that they decided to uh, take, part of an, take part in it. How to manage disruptive meetings. That's very good. Um, let's see, just do one more minute to see if there are any more answers. Just think through for yourself. Um, Okay, I think we have uh, the normal, okay, here's one more before we move on. Uh, to be able to be effective in meetings and learn to be productive member in meetings, that's great. Okay, so I'm going to go on and uh, share, uh, um, continue with the presentation. And actually, before we do that, uh, let's just move on to the next question. Something about yourself, yes, before we leave the space. And this is uh, to get people comfortable. So if, you know, we're in a physical room, you know, would speak about ourselves, um, especially if it was like a workshop, this is not the regular people that you meet with every single day and you want to have everybody uh, feel interested. So on the same page that you logged in, you will see it will give you the next question. So you just need to put in an answer to that. Um, so usually what we do in a physical environment is we put people into breakout rooms and um, you introduce yourself to each other and then also mention some interesting facts about each other. But in this environment, which is something you can also use when you have um, digital meetings is we use Menti to just like get some interesting facts about each other just to like a bit of an icebreaker to get to know each other. So anyone anything interesting like a, a work nickname perhaps uh, something some useful skill that you have outside of your work environment um, something fun that you've done perhaps um, anything like that just so we can get to know each other a bit. Okay, great. We have a passionate farmer and horticulture sphere. Um, yeah, I hope you're able to tell us a little bit about what horticulture is when we ask in between. Uh, we have someone saying they enjoy researching and learning new things, and there is a keyboard player in the house. 
and they used to pay for a church group called Salt and Light. Love the name. <laughs> uh, we have a someone who's good at organizing events. We need to speak to you after this. <laughs> um, just. Any more interesting things? <laughs> Someone says they love to talk. Well, we can... Um, wow, why don't you uh, unmute yourself a little bit like right now and tell us, you know, what are some of the favorite, your favorite things that you love to speak about? Um, and maybe even just, you know, who you are, so we can put their interest to the person, where you are, where you're from, what you do, and what do you love to talk about? All right, I guess you might be feeling a bit shy. So a great cook and someone who loves to travel and someone who finds it hard to talk about themselves. Um, they have a love for local and African series. Uh, interesting, you should share a few interesting African series. Uh, that might be interesting. And someone said they started reading novels when they were six. Oh my gosh, that's that's impressive. That's very impressive. Okay, um, I think I'm going to uh, stop here and then we're going to align to see out of um, the things that people uh, have expressed that they came here to learn, um, how much of that will this course cover? And if there are any gaps, we'll speak about them a little bit as to also how and where would you get an opportunity to um, address them. Okay. So, <clears throat> so as um, you can see already, this is a virtually facilitated and it's gonna be a very interactive session. So we're gonna keep doing uh, this Q&A on Menti uh, and asking for your input, asking you to participate, asking for your uh, you know, ideas or comments or experience because what we know is that, you know, as you are here, you are a professional already, you already know something, you already have your own experience. So this is a time to share that experience with other people and also hear what we have picked up uh, around what are some of the best practices so that we can complement your experience with some of this knowledge. Um, we will so keep encouraging to collaborate. There will even be opportunity to speak. So we're hoping that more of you will be uh, comfortable to open up your mic and answer from your personal experience. Otherwise, the chat box is always open as well if you don't feel like speaking, where you can input your uh, comment in the chat box and then we will keep reading. So leading effective meetings is about introducing you to techniques and practical tools that you can use uh, to lead effective meetings. At the end of this, you will learn those tools. We will demonstrate some of them uh, as well. And you will see that they are also uh, effective in leveraging the team's collective uh, intelligence ex and experience, because that is the root of where we are stemming from, that to say, um, in a workplace, moving forward, moving around, existing, knowing that, you know, you are not the only person that has ideas, that your team, the team that you work with also has idea. And as a leader, especially as you're growing into leadership, that being now your responsibility to increase, you know, the level of interaction to leverage the collective intelligence and experience so that your team can produce uh, better results. So we will cover a lot of uh, what everybody was uh, 
you know, have, have joined or is interested in learning. We will cover roles in meetings. I saw someone speaking about they've led meetings, they've facilitated meetings, they have someone saying, you know, scribing. We will speak about meeting roles and who needs to be involved for it to be effective. How do you, um, you know, distribute the roles and the and plan the activities that need to take place in a meeting. Uh, we'll talk about even the preparation that needs to happen so that you become a better facilitator. You know, before then, the agenda and uh, the process of even planning an agenda or doing an agenda. And then we will also speak about, you know, the intervention. Someone sp spoke about, you know, disruption, disruptive behavior in meetings, how to manage that. We will speak a little bit about that. And that's also one of the core uh, things uh, of principles of facilitations. So you will start getting bits and pieces about that, about how uh, your skill, personal skills as a facilitator will help you in this situation. And secondly, how the processes, the tools and techniques that we're gonna be sharing with you will help you be able to do uh, all of the things that we have asked. Um, uh, it was also more about allowing others, allowing the group to be, you know, in a space where they can productively contribute. And you will see it is less about you um, overpowering or um, being pretty much, you know, the only person who can contribute, but about the space for people in a constructive manner that drives the process towards a productive conclusion and tangible objectives. Now, with that being said, we're going to start with the very first um, tool that Connie is going to take you through, um, and it is uh, on fundamentals of facilitations. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Connie, as Mpo has already introduced. So what we'll start off with are ground rules. So to meet our objectives for the day, we will be going through a couple of ground rules. Um, before I start though, I'd like to just ask you all or anyone to just unmute yourselves and tell us what you think is the importance of having ground rules in any meeting or any session. I'll, I'll go first. Um... I think for you to conduct an effective meeting, uh, those ground rules will then guide how you are actually going to conduct an effective meeting. Okay, great. That's a that's a great response to that. So, um, thank you, Cleva. So, do you think it's effective if I just give you ground rules, or as a facilitator, do you think it's better if you let people decide on the ground rules themselves? Maybe from a collaborative perspective, we all need them to agree, but also being guided by the facilitator. Okay, great. So let's get into it then. Um, I'm going to just facilitate this discussion around some ground rules that you'd like to, to use during the session. Anything that you want us to abide by as a group as we go through the session. Remember, if I just give you ground rules, it's very hard for you to abide by them. But if we decide on, as a collective on ground rules, it'll help us keep track of everything we need to accomplish in this session. So maybe I can give you an example. Um, one of the ground rules could be keep your mics muted unless you are speaking. Anyone else with any other ideas for ground rules? hourly breaks of uh, five minutes okay that's a good one so um maybe let's make that specific so a five minute break at 10 o'clock and then another five minute break at 11 o'clock for five minutes anyone else have a ground rule raise your hand if you have a question okay thank you camilla so um number three would be 
raise your hand if you have a question. Anyone else with the ground rule? Uh, remember, you're also free to type it in the chat box if you feel a little sh mic shy. Okay, so um, anyone in the chats maybe? Unless these are the only ground rules we'd like to keep during the session. Okay, so remember ground rules are even though we're doing it for this session, this is also a facilitative tool that you can use to have effective meetings. So whenever you're running a meeting and you're the chairperson or the facilitator, um, just keep in mind that you can use ground rules to also keep track of that session. So again, you'll use the same, same process that we've gone through now, get people to um, mention any ground rules that they want to note. I see in the chats we have Zuleika who says um, timekeeping. So that's another good ground rule to add, timekeeping. So one, the first thing you do as a, as a facilitator is you explain what ground rules are to the group. And then the second thing would be to get some ground rule ideas from the people participating in the session. So as a facilitator, it's not your job to paraphrase what people say. You just note it down as they've said it. And then uh, once you've done that, you ask for any clarity. So if someone perhaps has clarity on, okay, so um, before I continue, Tepi says, keep your camera off. Okay, that's another ground rule we can add. So the third step is clarification. So we have five total ground rules now. So the third thing I do as a facilitator is ask for clarity. If there's anyone that needs clarity on any of these, please speak up and we can clarify from the person who's actually raised the idea. So an example of clarifying a question would be if someone, for example, said um, respect each person's opinion. If I ask clarity about that, I'd ask, what does that look like in the session? Like, how do I show that I'm respecting someone else's opinion? And the response to that could be that I'm not judgmental to what they've said. Um, I don't question them in a way that's harassing. I only question for further clarity. Um, if I'm respecting someone else's opinion, I can agree to disagree if that's what it needs to take. So that's just an example of how you can get clarity on some ground rules. So we can go through that for these ground rules. If anyone needs clarity on any of these, just raise your hand up or put it in the chat box. Otherwise, then the final step would be to get agreement. So we use a process called um, consensus test, which is a process that uses a first to five. So how it works is that you have, um, a, you can put your, your hand up to show whether you agree or disagree to a, a group of things that have been mentioned. In this case, we'll be using Menti because this is a physical environment. Um, but before we go to Menti, I'll just explain what, what each of the fists or fingers mean. So if you have a fist, it means that you don't agree um, and you need an alternative so that you can support the ideas. Um, if you have a one, one finger up, it means that you can't support it at the time and need more information. If you have two fingers up, it means you're not sure and need more discussion. And then if you have three fingers up, it means I'm not sure, but I'm willing to trust the group's opinion. Four fingers means I'm for the idea and I can support the idea. And five, which is the ideal, is that you're for the idea and can be a leader advocate for the idea. So the reason why you'd want to use this tool in a meeting or facilitative session is to ensure that everyone has a voice in the session. So oftentimes you'll come across um, someone who might be a dominative person in a group, someone who's always speaking, who's louder than everyone. Um, and that usually means that some people aren't heard in a session. So this is a great tool to use in any meeting that you have. So use a first to five to make sure that if someone's not supporting idea, you can easily uh, verify if they have a fist up so then you can address that issue. 
So just to use this for this session, uh, remember these were the ground rules that we've come up with. So we'll go through a mentee exercise where um, we'll, we'll vote on the ground rules. So remember fist is a hard no, there's something you don't agree on. And then five fingers is you're supporting the idea and you can be a leader for it. Ken Paul will share the screen. And then again, you'll log into mentee. You'll use the same code at the top. Um, and then you'll just vote for whether or not you agree with the ground rules that we've set. If you don't agree, you can raise a fist, one finger, two fingers, and then we'll address it from there. Okay, cool. Someone already voted five fingers, so you're good with all the ground rules. Okay, awesome. Getting more votes in. So again, every tool that we'll show you here, um, try and think about how you can apply it to your own meetings. Um, yes, Portia, you have your hand up. No, it's a mistake. I'm sorry. No problem. Okay, awesome. We're getting more votes in. So again, especially if you have people that don't really uh, want to speak out a lot in a meeting, this is a good tool to use to make sure that everyone has a voice. Um, so I see we have about 17 people in the group. So we'll try to get as many votes in before we move on, just so that everyone has participated and agreed on the rules. Okay, cool, we're getting more votes in. Awesome. Okay, so I think overall, um, there are no fists or anyone who doesn't agree with what we've discussed so far. So um, for the sake of time, we will move on. Just a second. Okay, cool. So what is change leadership? So what we'll be discussing in the next couple of hours are tips and tricks that you can use as a facilitator. So there are three different um, types of groups that you could interact, to, interact with as a facilitator. So the first is one to many. So this is a big group. So if you're a big organization with like 600 2,000 employees, that's one to many. You're one person addressing many people. Um, and then the second type of group you find is one to few. So something like this meeting that we're in currently, it's, a, it's got a few people, not more than say 50 people. Um, so these are meetings, workshops, training sessions. And then the third level you have is one-to-one. -one. So a meeting you have with one person. So it's a performance review, for example, a coaching session or an accountability discussion. So the things that we'll be discussing in this session can be applied to mostly two levels. So one-to-one -one or one-to-few. Some of the, the, the topics we'll discuss here aren't as effective and one-to-many. So just keep that in mind as we go through the training session that um, these are mostly for one-to-one -one or one-to-few. So let's just get a bit more um, discussion happening around what you believe facilitation is and what you believe it is not. So again, we're gonna use Menti. Um, 
So keep in mind again that in your own environments, when you have meetings, this is a powerful tool that you can use to get engagement, especially over the digital environment. If it's in person, it's easier to put people into, into little groups so they get discussion happening. But over Zoom or Teams, um, something like Menti is powerful. So I'm just gonna run a poll again to just get your idea of what facilitation is. And then in the next slide, we'll go through what facilitation is not. So for now, if you can again go on to Menti, use the code 25255818 and just let us know what you think facilitation is. If you're brave enough, you can even unmute your mic and tell us as well. Let's have a discussion. Let's hear what you think. Um, if you want to, but if, you, if you're not comfortable, you can just use Menti. Okay, great. So we have someone already populating our main team. Someone says, leading a discussion and assisting people to have the same understanding of a specific topic. Okay, great. Effective leading of the process. Yeah, that, those are both good. Anyone else? What do you think facilitation is? Guiding a meeting and the agenda for a specific outcome. Okay, great. Anyone else? I mean, if you're struggling with Minty, just let us know, we'll try help you out. If you're really, really struggling, you can put your answer in the chat box as well. Okay, cool. So we'll just leave it at that. Then, um, so three people have already said what they think facilitation is. Okay, someone else says making a process easy for others. Okay, great. So maybe we can now talk about the opposite end of it. So what, what facilitation is not? To provide opportunities and resources to a group of people that enable them to make progress and succeed. Awesome. Yep. Okay, so let's talk a bit about what facilitation is not. Um, so we'll move on to the next mentee slide. So if you could, again, please just um, tell us what you think facilitation is not. So do you think facilitation is lecturing? Do you think it's telling people what to do? Okay, someone says facilitation is not domineering. It's not being a dictator. It is not taking over the meeting and dictating. Yes, it's not one-sided. Only the person presenting does all the talking. Yes, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, that's why we always encourage like participation and engagement. We want people to talk. So if you really want to say something, please do unmute yourself. And um, like you can tell us what you're thinking when we're, when we're asking a question, or when we want a discussion to happen. Um, it's not dictating, yes. Okay, cool. Um, we'll move on then. So facilitation is 
about guiding a, a group to a desired outcome by encouraging collaboration and discussion amongst a group. So as a facilitator, your role is to basically make sure that everyone um, as a collective uses what they know to, to bring that to the table and discuss it. So oftentimes when you have a meeting, um, there are certain types of people that you can find in a group. So again, I'm gonna ask you what, you, what type of people have you in, uh, encountered when you have a meeting? Um, here we have four examples of people. So we have prisoners. So this person right here at the bottom corner. Um, and then we have movie critics. So in someone who can only find fault in what you're saying, they always have something negative to say. They always criticize any person's idea. Um, so we have those types of people. Um, you also have vacationers. So this person right here, um, someone who's just looking for a, a break, a free, a free break time, um, wants to chill out during the session, isn't really I'm saying much isn't really collaborating or giving their input. They're just sitting around enjoying themselves, probably on their phones or scrolling about other things on their computer during a meeting. Um, then you have explorers, people that are learners, contributors. So these are the, the different types of people that you often find in meetings. Has anyone encountered that when you've had your meetings? I'm sure a lot of us have. So movie critics, vacationer, prisoner, explorer. So as a facilitator, you wanna get as much collaboration and input from everyone. So you don't want people being prisoners, vacationers, or movie critics during your session. Um, you want to maximize team productivity. So your role as a facilitator is to extract as much value from the, from the group of people that you have, because remember, everyone has something valuable to offer, no matter what it is, even if it's a small amount or a big amount of contribution, everyone has something valuable to offer. So, now we'll just talk a bit about some of the challenges that you might have with meetings. Um, we're going to firstly um, note down any of the issues that you've encountered. So again, um, I'm gonna ask you to please unmute yourselves and then Paul will help me by noting them. What are some of the challenges that you've encountered in your meetings? Yes, Clever, you have your hand raised. Um, people are not coming to the meeting on time. Okay, yep, that's a, that's a good one. So people not coming to the meeting on time. Um, Sam, you have your hand raised up, yes. People accepting the meeting request but not attending. Yep. So people not uh, people accepting the meeting request and then not attending. Um, Camilla. Ah, uh, yes, that was going to be my point too. But also, when people do attend meetings, that they are because we are online, so often uh, people are not really present in meetings. Mm, okay, so people are not really present in meetings. That's also another good one. Tepi, I see you, ra you raised your hand and then put it down. Did you have a point to add? Yes, Tepi? No, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, Kia says load shedding as well. Okay. Anyone else? 
I'm pretty sure we all have lots of meetings happening. I'm sure we have more, more issues with meetings. Do you all have people sending you agendas with the meetings you have? Sam has a Sam, hand. Um, you have your hand up. People not participating in meetings. Yep, people not participating in meetings. That's a good one. Yes, Kelly. Um, a lot of discussion and then at the end of discussion, there's no resolution or, or action after that. Yeah, that's a, another big one. So a lot of discussion with no resolution at the end of the meeting. Um, Tepi says not following the agenda. Yep. Yes, Keva. Uh, disruptive uh, tendencies, tends, tendencies to sidetrack the issues that are being discussed. Okay, yeah. So um, can you just repeat that so we, we note your words as exactly as you said them? So you said disruptive? Yeah, side, side, side tracking the discussions or the agenda at hand and wanting to put people off the, the agenda. Okay, so side tracking discussions, putting people off the agenda. Okay, so I think we have a good amount of issues that um, that most people typically face. So while Paul continues to note them down, I'll just go on to the next slide. So there are two parts of meetings that we often encounter. So the one part is um, process, and then the other part of, of it is content. So what exactly are these two things? So Process is really about the how, whereas content is about the what. So when we talk about process, we're talking about a framework or a structured approach, uh, approach the process that you use um, in your meeting, whereas content is about the tangible discussion or the topic that you're actually discussing during the meeting. So that's the differentiating factor between the two. So again, now, if we go back to some of the things that we've mentioned here, we're just going to go through and note whether the issue is a process issue or it's a content issue. So we'll start with people not coming to meetings on time. Is that a process issue or a content issue? Tepi, yes, you have your hand up. Process, I think. Yeah, so that's a process issue. So people have not followed the process by coming on time. It's not necessarily to do with what is being discussed. So we can put a P next to people not coming to meetings on time. Um, and then accepting meeting requests, but not attending. Is that again, a process issue or a content issue? Yes, Cleva? Uh, a process. Process, yep. Um, okay, someone in the chat said process is Camilla, process, and then people attend but not really present, especially on the online platform. Is that a process issue or a content issue? Yes, Kiva? Uh, content content okay um okay someone also has something in the chat could be both um camilla says could be both so yeah let's let's go ahead with that so it could be process it could be content so we can put a p and c next to it sorry it's not refreshing very fast but yeah. it will show up soon enough yeah, so as, as we're doing this, important is adding the notes to the slide. I'm sure it'll pop up soon. Um, so we can move on to load shedding. Is that a process or a content issue? That's very external though. <laughs> <laughs> because ESCOM is its own thing. Um, so I'm not sure about that one. I don't know what people think. Is that, what do you think that that is? Does it fit as a process or content issue? Or is that just an external issue that you can't really control? Um, yes, Sepi. 
Okay, I think it's external, but it affects like the process. So if maybe you knew um, that three of the people that um, that have to be in the meeting have load shedding, then you can schedule accordingly. So I think it's external, but it affects process, not really con not necessarily content. Yep, that's a very good point. Um, Yakia also says it's external. So we'll put a P next to that because that's a very valid point. If if you if you are aware of the load shedding schedule, um, you could plan your 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 meeting at a different time to accommodate everyone. So yeah, so we'll put a P next to it. Um, and then people not participating in, in the meetings, is that process or content issue? Um, yes, Naz, Nazli. I think that would be process. Process, yep. Um, Camilla, you also have your hand up. No, I think it could be both again, uh, process and, and content. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, then let's just do one more and then uh, we'll, we'll move on. So a lot of discussion with no resolutions at the end of the meeting. Is that a process issue or a content issue? I think that would be content. Okay, can you maybe elaborate on why you think it's it's content? Um, <laughs> let me think about that one, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, while you think about that, Nesli, Camilla, you, you have your hand up. What do you think? I think it's definitely process. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if there's a discussion and a, and, a, and a point to be made, it can be you know, driven by a process to get an outcome. Yeah, exactly. So what you'll see here is that most of the issues that people encounter are really because of the process. So people not coming to meetings on time, that's because of a process. If you haven't put a process in place or ground rules in place that ensure that people are there on time, that affects whether people come on time or come late. Um, people accepting meeting requests and not attending, that's also a process issue that really is not about the content or subject matter happening in the meeting. Um, people attend but are not really present, especially on the online platform. Well, yeah, that's a bit of both. Um, but people not participating could also be that as a facilitator, you've invited the wrong people to the meeting, which happens so many times. I'm sure many of us have gone to meetings and you're sitting there wondering, why am I in this meeting? It has nothing to do with me or I have nothing valuable to add in this particular meeting. So people that have meetings for the sake of meetings, you find that um, they haven't invited the right or necessary people in the meeting. Another one is a lot of discussion happening with no resolution at the end of the meeting. So when you've prepped your agenda thoroughly, you should have as a facilitator ensured that you've put the necessary steps you want to follow in the meeting so that it leads you to an end where you have an outcome. So those are the two things we just wanted to highlight here in terms of process, content and challenges with meetings. Um, so a lot of it is about process, like I've said already. So everything we're going to be talking about in this session is to help you improve the process of how you facilitate, plan, and run meetings. Okay, so any questions or comments of what we've on what we've done so far? If not, uh, we'll move on to the next the next section. I know we have a a break planned at 10 o'clock according to our, our ground rules. So do you want to take the break now and come back at 10? Or do you want to continue and then start at 10? I mean, and then stop at 10 for five minutes. Um, yes, Camilla? Can we maybe stop at have our break at 10? I think most people's load shedding schedules will start at 10. Uh, mine will. Um, and then there might be a bit of an interruption. So I would prefer having a break at 10. Okay, cool. So let's continue. Paul will continue on. All right. Um, 
Okay, thank you, Kane. Um, so this, I think everybody can agree from this exercise that from your own experience, you have seen that the majority of the challenges that um, the meetings that we attend are more process than content uh, related. So it is not necessarily that, you know, we are not, you know, smart enough people to understand what we're talking about, but it is about the guidance and the facilitation that needs to lead us to those tangible objectives that productive outcomes that are going to lead to um, decisions that will make an impact into in the overall organization. Um, so this is, you know, why, um, you know, we say, you know, this is why you need to use facilitation um, tools and techniques. Now, I want you to just think back in all these meetings that you attend. Do you ever find that there is a shortage of solutions or ideas? Who has experienced in meetings where there was a shortage of ideas? Uh, clever, go ahead. Yeah, in my experience, uh, it's more often than not. That you, you, you come short of ideas. I mean, people just talk, but at the end of the day, there's not really a, a solution to the end of that discussion. Okay. So it's really more about that uh, there's lack of um, direction towards, you know, what are we uh, solving? Um, but can I ask, in just in addition to that, how much time do you find that you actually spend discussing what the actual problem is before we start problem solving or getting into solution mode? So if, if say, you, you know, you are in a um, root cause or in a uh, workshop for ideas, how much time do we spend discussing what the actual problem is? If you were to give it a percentage. I, I would say two, 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 two thirds of that time. Two thirds, okay. Mm. All right, I have to say, I congratulate you. Your meetings then, they should have really great solutions um, because we tend to see people jump into solutions before they've actually had agreement onto what the problem is. Um, and we find this a lot where we go into organizations, even a simple exercise to say, you know, you work in a plant and let's say we want to draw your value stream map and, you know, where does your process start? Where does your process end? It always is very curious to see how diverse the views are as to what people consider the beginning or the end of the process. Um, and also even within the operation itself, you know, where does your component begin and where does your component end, you know? And that's where you end up having, you know, those limbos of beans where, you know, everybody else can move so fast, but then you have this in-between stage that nobody actually even know, um, you know, who's responsible for it. So facilitation tools, uh, and techniques are good in that when you come into a meeting or a, a session where you are workshopping a, a solution or a problem to say, before we get into solution, let's actually spend time um, understanding from everybody's view what they consider the problem or even, you know, what is the most predominant problem? Um, what are we trying to solve? What should we be trying to solve? And even if there is some form of commonality, what do people actually think that means as to what the problem is? When we get uh, to later um, stages or even more advanced courses of our analysis in additional modules that we have, we even, you know, quantify it and to say, you know, what would you consider to be, you know, your causes and sources of problems, um, you know, your, 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 so your sources. Um, and then once that those have been, you know, put up as to say, you know, these are the possible areas. Then you lead through a facilitation stage where um, you narrow down and get agreement as to 
what people consider the biggest problems or the most relevant uh, definition to what the problem that you are coming together is. Then once you have passed that stage, then only then, you know, you open up to say, okay, given the problems that we've just agreed on, that this is the problem or these are the biggest problems, then what kind of solutions can we come up with? And then you collect those divergent, innovative ideas that people come up with to say, you know, this is how we can solve this problem. And then after that, you have a method to say, you know, how do we narrow it down? How do we make a decision that everybody agrees with to say, these are the best solutions. These are the best choices that uh, we think we can make to be able to overcome the problem that we have. Um, does it make does it make sense? You know, does it or is it is it warped to 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 how you perceived? You know how the process ends up being, and you know if you've had facilitation that happens like this, where you do start, you know, with a problem and then a solution satisfactory. Um, you can let us know. Okay, um, so it is time for a break. I see someone on the comments. Thanks for reminding us. Um, we can just wrap up with questions when we come back. We'll see you at seven minutes past 10. Sorry for going two minutes over. Okay, welcome back everybody. Hopefully, I don't see that we lost a lot of people. I think we only lost two people uh, if it's due to the load shedding. So that's great news. Um, so yeah, we can get right back into it. Now, given that we have um, already uh, revealed and, and, and even from your experience, even from the activity that we did, that the majority of the problems with meetings are actually process and not content, you know, then the role of facilitation becomes very key. And then it's like, you know, what kind of facilitator, you know, would be ideal? Now, we have three kinds of facilitative roles one might play. Um, we begin with I think actually before I, I get to that, um, you know, has has any of you experienced a a very good like outstanding facilitator, whether in a meeting or a workshop? Like, has it, does anybody have like really great experience with a facilitator? Uh, Tepi. Um, yep. Recently I attended like one, like, um, a short course. Yes. Uh, it was online. Uh -huh. So the facilitator was very, like, she kept us engaged, you know, mm -hmm. um, throughout, like nothing was left to just, um, her saying something or just as, you know, like everything that was done, um, was a discussion, you know, okay. so it was. It was nice. Uh, and then also like we were like we were like this online, mm. but we kept like when you were talking or when you had something to add and or maybe she gave us an activity or something, uh, we would have to was that um our cameras had to be on. Mm. So anytime there's that interaction, like we we did it that way. So it was quite yeah. um yeah, engaging. Very so, engaging. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you said it was nice. If I can ask for more vocab as to like, you know, how that made you feel as a participant to, you know, be included in conversation, you know, to have that active participation that where you feel like what you are inputting is valuable and there is room for it to be heard. Correct. Yeah. Because I, I think what made it, the reason I say it was like, great like what she did from her end mm -hmm. is that um you know you had to you had to engage and everything that you said like you could see people's reactions as well to what you were saying so anytime yeah. it was time for discussion 
and you are having a discussion like it's it was nice to see that everyone is listening to you it's and engaging. therefore you can have like um you know like the confidence that you either understand or you don't understand or you are in line with what's being discussed and whatnot so that's that 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 was it for me yeah yeah great great um, I think, I mean, listen, as a facilitator as well, you definitely can move um, your team towards uh, that kind of engagement and even showing videos. We definitely also video people uh, because we think it does keep you a little bit um, honest. And, 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 you know, because, you know, we are as a societal, as human beings, we do um, like to, uh, how, what's the word, like, um, have similarities and commonalities with the people that we're in. And in, if we're in an environment, we feel like, you know, this kind of behavior is acceptable, we will behave in a certain way. So when you have a video on, you probably will uh, want to pay more attention because you know people can see you. Um, keeps you honest in a way, but it also is valuable for you as well to keep you engaged. Thank you so much for that input, Tepi. And I mean, this is literally as a facilitator, what you must be aiming for to be um, engaging your, 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 the people that you are in a workshop or meeting with or training with, um, to listen to them, to give them room, because when you do give them room, then you create a very welcoming environment for them to learn and uh, to also uh, contribute to the learning process as well. And this kind of facilitator that we usually find ideal uh, for this is what we would call a neutral facilitator. A neutral facilitator doesn't need to be someone who is an expert in the content that's being discussed. Um, and they ideally should not have any um, vested interest into also the, what is being discussed. So they, sh they are key role and focus is to manage the process and ensure a safe environment where everybody is free to participate and also to do proper planning so to uh, so that they can facilitate a smooth uh, you know uh, procession throughout the agenda activities that are outlined. Um, but obviously this is the real world and uh, on a day to day it's hard to have a very neutral facilitator someone without any knowledge or content of what we're working on coming in into your space and you know helping out you facilitate your meeting. Um, so what usually happen is that you will have a non-neutral facilitator, which is a role that we you often try to play. This is where you are really aware of the process of facilitation. You are aware of what it takes to lead an effective meeting. However, you do have some vested interest because it could be your project. You could be a contributing member in that project as well. Um, so you are not someone who is unfamiliar with the content that's being discussed. So in that case, you will end up obviously contributing and you probably could have some bias. So it is not ideal, but it is what we usually end up with. However, you could help yourself and have what we call a, um, what, what, uh, where you ask someone else in the team who is well-versed with the process to say, listen, um, this is my, my, my meeting. I've planned it like so. However, I have a lot of input that I'm going to give. Can you help me uh, keep in check with the process? Can you be my process checker? Can you help make sure that nothing gets derailed? Um, however, so that's what happens when you are a, a neutral facilitator and you end up getting into content. So you can get a facilitative team member and then they will help you with that process. So this is the person who will know, you know, how to deal with when items are outside the agenda, how to deal with disruptive behavior, how to, you know, make everybody honest to the time that they have allocated for certain discussions. Um, any, any questions, any comments on that? And, you know, any, 
um, feelings as to how people think this could work if they try to implement this. Okay. Um, so I'll move on to that and say, let's start just by analyzing this spectrum that looks at the responsibility shown, um, you know, with regards to leading or learning. And this indicates the roles that people play in an organization or leaders play in organization. So on the on the left hand hand side, you see where you have um, a leader that is more instruction centered that, you know, gives out information, transmits information, lectures. So they usually are more about, you know, telling people um, while at, you know, the right hand side, then you have a receiver centered. So this is a leader who uh, listens a lot and uh, you know, learns as well from, you know, the environment that they are in. And we, facilitation is centered towards more to the right-hand side, where we encourage that instead of giving answers or focusing on content or technical elements, um, you rely on, you know, the people that you work with to be part of, you know, the the process of giving you uh, solutions to those innovative ideas that your job is to extract the answers, to extract solutions. You are focusing on the process and uh, you're balancing, you know, you, and, and, and it's more that, you know, you, you speak less and you listen more because um, there is so much wisdom as well in the room. So facilitation is centered more towards that, towards more listening instead of lecturing and transmitting of information. Um, so when you are in a facilitative role, this is um, the kind of framework that we would advise you to have in mind. And the reason for this is that, you know, when people do um, participate actively, they learn better as well. And if this was like a part of change management and there were new solutions uh, to be implemented, changes to be made, the more people come up with the changes, the more uh, they will be um, vested in making sure that they are successful in coming out because, you know, they feel like um, it's something, you know, that they have sort of co-created and it's not something that's just put on them and, you know, told them this is the new way and this is what you have to deal with. So they are more uh, responsible themselves as well for making sure that whatever that was discussed, whatever that solutions that we raised and adopted, um, that they were part of it, they were part of the decision making. Okay, so finally, I will move us into this um, learning diagram. Do you see it on your side? Yeah, okay. So I'm going to ask us to be a little bit interactive here because this is a sort of the four uh, plus one matrix um, that, you know, covers the stages of learning. And to demonstrate this, you usually ask people about their driving experience. Like when you first started driving, like when you started driving, like anybody take me back to the first time they were in a car and they were driving. How was the experience? Fun? I see a comment in the chat. Terrifying. Uh, Kelly said it was terrifying. Um, anybody else? Anybody else know how it felt the very first time, you know, the first lessons or whatever it was, the first experience that they had and say, I'm studying a car, I'm trying to drive myself. 
scary yeah so it's definitely an uneasy feeling um never scary terrifying it is uncomfortable and it is it is a discovery um at that point you realize oh my gosh i don't know how to drive and i mean i don't know you know the the the, the part before that where you didn't know how to drive but it almost didn't matter until that very first moment you got into a car um we call that you know the naive stage of unconscious incompetence where you don't even know uh that you don't learn but can someone tell me then then after that first experience and they knew that you know they wanted to know driving you know what did they do what did you do after that first experience to say i know that i don't know but i want to know So what did you do after the first time you said, oh, this is terrifying. I'm never doing this again. Um, what, what did you do? What did you do? How did you gain confidence, uh, Clever, after that first attempt? Uh, because now, now that, that first attempt, I'm saying this is doable. So i can okay. still i can i can still do it so gradually that confidence creeps in and then i start driving okay um so how did that how did that confidence build what actions did you take to build that confidence i'm saying after having been told that you do this you watch you start and whatever mm. and the car is and the car is now moving rolling and you yeah starting to get that and then then you 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 carry on like that. so basically you were learning you got someone to teach you this is how you start a car this is how you balance a clutch this is how you know you you turn if it if it does this that means the power is not enough or the clutch is not high enough and that's how this is the process where you move from uh what you don't know to uh conscious competence when you when you do know um i, I don't know if anybody has a story but i'll tell you the story of when i had my driver's license i had a car but um all of a sudden it was actually the first time i was in the car by myself so by this time i i had passed my driver's license i had driven quite a number of times but always with someone next to me and now this was the first time i was going to work i just got in myself on a new car and i remember you know it was all ceremonial i got into the car and i put in our favorite cd and you know i strapped myself in and then started the car and drove the trip to work was somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes uh i played that cd so many times before i pretty much knew the songs and i remember by the time i got into the parking lot at work i realized i had not heard a single song <laughs> in the cd because that's how focused i was in what i was doing so i was competent and i was conscious of it but there was a lot of effort in doing what you know needed to be done but you know skip a few years later and i you know leave work and i'll be like yeah i want to pass by pick and pay and before i know it i'm in front of the complex of my house and i'm like how did i get here my plan was to pass and, and you know and run a few errands on the way and it had become you know unconscious competent i didn't even need to think about it anymore and i mean i don't know if anybody you know can you know, hazard a guess, you know, how do we do that? How do we move from, you know, not knowing, you know, then we learn and then we, we know, but we are consciously competent and it's hard and it's a lot of effort. And then next thing you know, it's secondhand nature and it's intuitive. How do we move there, Sam? By doing it all the time and con constantly repeating yeah. it. Yeah, by doing it over and over and over and over again. So the same with facilitation. When it's when you start, um, it will be hard. You will remember all these things that you know. I must do this. I must not get into content. I must keep to the process. Um, and 
and and and and you know what needs to happen and it's in your mind but it's such a conscious effort to put in because now you are no longer naive now you are actually in the learning part you are getting into the nuts and bolts of you know what does it take to be a facilitator what does it take to um uh, conduct and lead effective meetings however the first time you're doing it it's gonna be hard it's gonna be like that a uh, few first time that you know you had you know were learning how to drive and you knew what to do but it wasn't second nature it was very hard everything you had to reread and recheck as to how it's done however there is a fifth stage um after the second nature where um you have now surpassed just the stage of um you know unconscious competence and that second nature uh when you move beyond that and this is what we call reflective competence um and how do you think one gets to that stage and and what do you think it even means uh, you know what would you be doing when you have moved beyond the, it being a second nature and you are now into reflective competence Anybody has it, I guess. So I think um, I could say it, it starts with, um, like it's saying reflective. So asking yourself, you know, how do I impart my knowledge? So when you move towards teaching, you know, I think it's very interesting, you know, if you today try to teach someone something that you know very well, that comes so secondhand that you don't even think about it, but all of a sudden you have to explain to someone like, okay, this is how you drive, or this is how you hold a pen, like teaching a child, this is how you hold chopsticks. You know, imagine trying to explain that process to someone who has never done it into them, to their life. Then all of a sudden it's now reflecting back as to, you know, what are those steps that you take? What makes it easy? What makes it effort? Maybe even looking back as to how you learned and maybe what are some of the things that, you know, um, you can, warn them in advance you say you know look out for this look out for that uh, so that's the step where you are at reflective competence however it is a lot of effort because it's something that you're going to have to be doing if you want to uh, become a mature practitioner of facilitation you will have to look back every single time at what you did you know where did you go wrong uh, how could you improve and keep studying and studying until you become not just secondhand uh, intuitive edit, but something that you can impart to someone else as well, uh, because you're continuously reflecting, you're continuously growing, you're continuously learning and finding out what works from experience as well, you know, practical, it's, it's about practical, uh, what works and what doesn't work um, and how you grow that and deepen that knowledge. And I think it's not just in facilitation, it's in everything. If you want to move towards that, you know, master stage, it's about, you know, continuous self-study and review, even peer review, asking for feedback from other people that reflection it. It is deliberate. It doesn't come almost as uh, natural as what practice does that moves you to unconscious competence. It's actually something that you have to be deliberate and intentional with. Okay, so just um, in summary, uh, to be an effective uh, facilitator, you have to have a range of skill of planning and conducting meetings. Uh, creating a team environment where teamwork flourishes and making decisions 
and building group consensus. So, you know, driving a group towards a decision through a consensus process, giving and receiving feedback, building rapport, that is like the trust for people to be able to be open with you and be able to trust you and feel com comfortable enough to give you their ideas and uh, communicating, clear communicating. And as we know, communicating is not just about you speaking, it's also about listening and doing that ratio where you listen more than you speak and learning how to deal with disruptive behavior. So, um, this course we were very we're gonna we're gonna have a um, a section where we teach you that as well but in more advanced courses that we do we even lead it to conflict management how do you deal with conflict management in a team key points though to take away from as a facilitator every time you sit into a meeting and they say you are leading this meeting remember to focus on process 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 if that's sorted out 80 to 90% of your problems are gonna be taken care of. And then as we've said, practice, practice, practice. The first time you try it, it's not going to feel good. It's not going to feel comfortable. But the more you do it, the more natural is going to keep coming out. And the more you're going to build that uh, experience and be able to judge different situations, to, give, to use different tools and techniques that help you deal with the situation. Any questions before we move on to the next section or comments? You know, if you have anything to add, maybe on you know your experience as well uh, on any of the content we just covered. Okay, in the absence of any, I will proceed. So. Uh, this is the part now where we speak about what we're really here for as well, like uh, in respect to meetings, you know, uh, facilitation with respect to meetings, you know, how do we get that excellence in the meetings? At the end of the session, you will be able to plan a meeting and, um, you know, why would that be important to you? So we're going to switch to Menti because we're going to deal with, we're going to ask two questions and let's see just how impacted you are. So on Menti, tell us how many meetings that you have a week. So this is a week. And then you will see there is a multiple choice that gives you, uh, so it, it's bucket, you know, uh, you know, uh, like from a few to many a week, but there's like numbers there. So you can just think back as to roughly how many meetings you have. And we, be, we mean both physical and digital meetings. And then the next question after that is gonna be how effective you think those meetings are. So there on the same website, menti.com, indicate from zero to three or three to six or six to nine or nine to 12 or more than 12 a week. How many meetings do you roughly have a week? So we have two people responding so far. One is three to six, the other one is six to nine. If you had logged out, uh, you can go back to www.menti.com on your cell phone or on your computer and use that code that's there at the top, uh, 25255818. And then indicate, you know, how many meetings you have a week on average. So I like it. There's a big sprite here. There's a nice distribution of the different levels of people, uh, different number of meetings people have a week. So we have 10 people answered so far. I think that is the majority of the people present. And um, so a few lucky people there who have like um, between zero and three meetings a week. And, but you also have, you know, people that have, uh, you know, up to 12 meetings a week, which is, you know, quite a lot uh, because meetings do take to take a lot of time. Uh, so the next question we're going to ask is, um, 
how productive do you think they are? So how effective do you think they are? And obviously effective meetings, you feel like, you know, you, it's the one way you know it was worth your time. There were decisions reached, there were, you know, actions achieved, it, you know, achieved what it said it was going to achieve and definitely did not waste your time. So um, how effective with, are these meetings in general that you go to? Um, how, how happy are you with the outcomes at the end of these meetings? So as we waiting for a few more people to wait, I'm going to ask the three people of 75 to 100 to just maybe tell us, you know, uh, we can learn something here, like we're saying, we're collecting best practices. Uh, maybe tell us one or two things that you think um, enable those meetings that you attend to be so highly effective. I don't know if any of the, Nasli? I am for, yeah, for me, I find it, uh, I, I get a lot of information, like when I need assistance from the committee. Mm. So it's effective for me. Mm. And what do you think drives that? Like, uh, what, what do you think are uh, some of the, the, the tricks and tools that you guys implement when you're running that meeting that make it so informative and insightful? Because I think that the, the committee knows without the, the input, then uh, we, we won't get, it won't be able, we won't be able to carry on with our process. So, mm, okay. So you have people that are there present and contributing. Yes. All right. Awesome. Uh, Tepi, are you also people with highly uh, effective meetings? Yes. Okay. And what do you think, uh, you have pinpointed the success of your meetings too? Okay. Also, I'm one of the zero to three meetings, ne? So. Okay. <laughs> ah, that be the secret. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it's different kind of meetings. Um, like my observation is based on different meetings. Yeah. So it's um like the weekly uh production meeting that we have as a team, mm -hmm. and some of um, like um, meetings that we have with external people, like your committee meetings and whatnot. Yes. So I think what makes these meetings work um, for us is that we have a plan, you know, like before you go into a meeting, you mm -hmm. know what you need to report on. So mm -hmm. I think the process to us having the meeting is very clear. We know objectives of why we are attending the meeting. Mm -hmm. And therefore it's, it's very... Um, yeah, so you, when you know, you, you like when you go when you know with you're expectations, there, yeah. you know, you, they, are, yeah, they are met. And when you go to give reports, you go prepared. So I think that's what works there. And, um, you know, the communication is very clear. And then yeah. with, with committee members, it's, it's, it's similar, is that they come into the meeting, they already have an agenda, they know what the discussions are going to be about. And therefore, you know, by the end of the meeting, you have actions, you already know what you need to do, what you need to prepare before the next meeting. And you also come prepared knowing what is it that is expected from you as a person, like what, what your contribution is going to be. So I think it's mainly preparation, like just the process before going into the meeting. Makes okay. them very effective. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, those are all real, like great, great, great um, feedback because um, it is really about that preparation in advance that, you know, make uh the the sauce the secret sauce and you will find here as well what i'm going to present is that um that's where it starts uh, the first step to uh, a meeting plan is to ask you know you know what will success look like and so this is around you know setting goals um, because without goals, then, you know, you can't predict what the outcome will be, you know, and I can just ask you even personally, um, you know, 
what do you think about goal setting and why do you think it's important? I mean, imagine uh, your life right now, you probably have some goals. You know, why do you do that? Why do you feel it's important for you personally to have goals? Kelly? Um, I'd say it gives purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And um, because, you know, yeah, yes, Camilla, you can add. It just it, it motivates and drives you to, to your success. Mm. And on an emotional level, what do we think goals do for us? A couple of hands raised. Let me just see who. Uh, Sam? It gives us something to work towards. Yes. Yes, definitely. It's like, you know, it does fuel us. It gives us that motivation, like Camilla as well mentioned. And now, can I just say, Nazdi, maybe you can answer this one. I know you might have wanted to add. But what happens when someone has no goals or you know, can you describe that behavior when someone has no goals? Um, <laughs> withdrawn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they become very withdrawn. Uh, what then, wanted, sorry, what I wanted to add was when you achieve your goals, you, you have yeah. confidence and you, you, so you feel proud of yourself. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you feel comfortable, you feel confident. Uh, you know, it can build up to bigger and bigger things. Um, I have a comment in the chat. Yeah, the satisfaction. Uh, but now let's talk about the no goal scenario. What happens when someone has no goals? You know, what kind of behavior do they have? You know, do they, what, they, they don't have the confidence, like we say, they don't have the drive. You know, what do they have then when it's the opposite? What happens when you're in that situation, when there are no goals? Confusion. Yes. Thanks, Clever. Any other... Uh, comments as to you know how you will end up with in a group of people with no goals um and i like that i i feel like confusion is probably when it comes to meeting a one of the very sum, summing thing so that's why it's very important to to plan for a meeting and start with an outcome about you know what will success look like um, and then once you have moved on to that, then you go to the next stage and say, okay, then why are we doing this? Why are we having these meetings? Yes, we know what success of this meeting will look like, but why are we having it? How does this meeting relate to the company strategy or to the targets that we've set, you know, for this month or for this year? Align this meeting to an existing purpose or if it's a new one, wh whatever it might be, but it has to be aligned because when it is aligned, then it gives people that energy and also relevance as to why this is important, why they need to spend their time on it to begin with. So if your meeting has no why, then why must I attend? And this is the reason why with poorly planned meeting can actually invite the disruptive behavior that some you know you will end up with where people are scrolling social media or you know saying anything else that pops into their heads because they don't see the importance the purpose of this they cannot relate it to anything that uh, is of value um so once you have now you know, understood the outcomes, you know, what you want to see at the end, um, why you're doing it, then you say, you know, what are the results along the way, like uh, the achievements at each stage in the meetings, you know, this will be like hard, tangible things like, you know, uh, you know, list of, you know, top things to do or um, action, you know, action items or plans. So this will be hard, tangible things that you will say, I will achieve in this meeting to make sure that I will reach that successful outcome that I wanted. And then the next thing is then, you know, the nitty gritty of, you know, how do I do that? You know, the tools and techniques, how will I get there? 
uh, what will help me achieve that result, that tangible result? You know, will it be a workshop, a facilitate, you know, how will this facilitation happen? Or, you know, will we need to do some multi-voting or will we need to brainstorm? And once we've brainstormed, how are we going to synthesize and distill the ideas and pick the best ones? You know, because it's not just about coming up with ideas, it's also how to agree, you know, how are you going to get consensus? You've already learned a tool on consensus at the beginning of this. You know, how do we get something at the end of the day that everybody's going to agree with and is going to be a... Uh, uh, an action that will achieve the results and ultimately the outcomes that we have uh, for the meeting. And then the rest of it is just, you know, the, the nitty gritty is who, you know, uh, who's going to be doing what, timing, you know, how long you're allocating for that, and maybe even additional materials that you might need uh, for that. So, um, can I then ask, just after seeing this sort of meeting planning framework, um, how does this relate um, to the meetings that you are attending, um, especially maybe some that are not going to well-planned meetings? Where are you already identifying, you know, the, the gaps with the meetings that you usually attend? Anyone, yeah, seeing anything curious? I see a chat. Uh, so I see Clever says most don't have a why at the beginning. Um, so yeah, so that lack of, you know, aligning it to the overall company, um, you know, business, uh, I guess, business case or, you know, um, becomes very draining because you know you wonder why you're wasting your time with it if it doesn't have any direct impact to anything that the company actually cares about. So that's a good one. Any other one? How, how have you seen a gap? Have you identified any gap, any gaps with uh, this kind of planning and and the meeting and the meetings that you are attending to? All right. If not, we'll just proceed, you know, to the next step. And this is like a template that I will um, show with you more as well, where we will go through it as to, you know, a meeting agenda. It's very simple. It already shows the our framework. Actually, just to go back here, uh, the, the acronym we use for this framework is, you know, OPRA, the O for outcome, P for purpose, R for results, and A for action, so OPRA. Uh, so that's the acronym that we use for um, the framework that we use for meeting planning. Um, so uh, as you know, already uh, discussed, the outcomes will be looking at, you know, the what, you know, uh, what will success look like? What will we get, you know, at the end of this? Why, why is that important? And then, uh, then this is how you can then line it. So the results will be those things that you will do that will ultimately make sure that you achieve your outcomes. So you might have one single outcomes, but it might have multiple steps that will need to take place, whether in the same meetings or in multiple meetings to make sure that it's achieved. So under results, those are the kind of things that you will need to plan to say, okay, these are the kind of outcomes or the kind of um, achievements that we'll have to reach along the way for us to ultimately reach that outcome, which is what we have defined success as. And that's one of those key things where you need to start kind of the end in mind as they always say knowing what ultimately do you want to go instead of just starting and waddling on and then you know hoping that things are going to form themselves uh the remaining uh columns then are looking at, at to the how i've already touched a little bit on this so these will be the methodology and the tools that you're going to employ 
Um, you know, are you going to use consensus? Are you going to use brainstorming? Are you going to use, um, you know, N3 kind of voting to consolidate ideas? Uh, so there are different, some tools and techniques that you can use for, to achieve whatever results, you know, whether it be just analysis of what is presented and coming up with solutions, um, um, or, you know, brainstorming innovative solutions and collecting those and then deciding from that, drawing an action list, uh, getting those ideas from people. So how are you going to do that and how are you going to prioritize and get them into something actionable? And then at the end, you know, who's going to do what? You know, some things are not necessarily all going to be done by you because you have other people there. So the people that are you inviting to the meetings have to be contributing to one, you know, uh, of those things that are in your uh, results uh, so that you don't have vacationers, people who don't know why they are there. So you have to be having people who are going to be actively contributing. Um, yeah, of course, if it's a brainstorming idea about something you know that affects everybody yes then you can you know make sure everybody understands it's going to be a whole team involved but on concrete project things or daily you know operational things you should know the key people that are going to contribute to the certain segments that are going to bring you to the outcome um, and then only invite those relevant people any comments, suggestions, anybody do something different, but they think that it sort of works for them that they don't see in here? Maybe you can share with us something that we might need to consider. Okay. Um, Right, without any further question, let's see. We are seven minutes away from our next break. Um, it's fine, yes, uh, I can end off with this section. So this is on, right, before we move on. Yeah, Clever Things is a good framework. Yeah, we think so too. And uh, after the break, we're going to do a demo on, on it so that you actually can uh, see it at work and then you can envision how it's going to be for when you use it and your projects, uh, in your meetings, in your workshops. Um, so someone asks about, about roles earlier and um, it's, it's good to understand that you don't need to do everything when you're in a meeting and it is okay to delegate responsibility uh, to other people, it actually will uh, increase them feeling, you know, participatory and relevant to a meeting. Um, so you, there is the role of the facilitator, sometimes called chairperson, that needs to be there. This ideally, as we've said, is someone who's going to take care of the process, drive the process, um, and lead the meeting. Someone who has, you know, for a forehand prepared an agenda and it's the one that is going to be um, running the, the meeting and directing it. Um, ideally, the facilitator shouldn't be a scribe, but that should be a separate um, role. Um, also, there is a role of a timekeeper. As you saw, there was a section for time allocation. Each action items, when you know the content, you can give it roughly the discussion time. Uh, also knowing what it will take to get to the decision, having thought through, you know, sufficiently what is required. You can assign times to the agenda items and you have someone to just make you um, cognitive and always remember that to just keep time so that things don't uh, go above board and then the meeting is over and only one item was half discussed. And obviously you're gonna have the right team members. These are the people that are going to be contributing, uh, who have valuable input to give, who are there because they have, you know, they are relevant and related to whatever the discussion is. And then in addition, you can have a process checker. Remember we said, you know, there are three types of facilitative uh, 
roles that you can take. In a case where you are not just neutral facilitator, you can have a process checker, which is someone then who's going to, you know, remind you that, you know, you might be delving too much into content as a facilitator, or the discussion might have deviated to something that was outside the agenda, and therefore, maybe must be parked separately and separate action be taken, maybe a separate discussion with the relevant people, you know, these things that sometimes we'll say offline, things like that. So this could be that person who could identify things that are not part of, you know, are not going to contribute towards the outcome that we have envisioned for that meeting. And so that will be uh, that person who can sh uh, share the responsibility with the facilitator or keep the facilitator in check. Now, some of these roles can be consolidated. You don't have to have five different people, but you know, I do definitely think that the facilitator role uh, should not, should be like squarely um, aside and assign someone to scribble actions, important actions and, uh, decisions that were reached, um, as well as, you know, the people responsible for them um, to make sure that they come to, to, to fruition. Okay, um, so we're like three minutes away. I think this is a good place to take a break. Before we go, if there are any questions, you can let me know. Um, maybe even, you know, what roles that you uh feel like must have separate people you know uh we just uh, express the facilitator definitely must be separate um or if there are any other roles that we could be missing out that you have found to work for the meetings that you have been in um you can just let us know before we go on the break Okay, if there is nothing, it is currently two minutes to 11. Um, we're going to take our five minute break. So we should be back roughly around four minutes past 11. Okay, are we all back? Okay, so this is going to be the part of the demonstration where we're going to use that, you know, agenda and uh, planning framework that we've just went through that follow the OPRA, the acronym that follow OPRA. Um, and the, we're going to play a little role here. We're going to do a little bit role playing. And the scenario is we have a child and the child is not doing well at school and we need to plan a meeting uh, we need to um, speak to our meet with our child's teacher um, to speak about this and so what we're going to do now is that we're going to plan the agenda for that meeting and how we're we going to do that. So this is what we're going to do. Uh, the planning of the agenda that's going to be dealing with our underperforming child with the teacher. So before we get there, I'm going to quickly get off and show you uh, a quick trick that we use here to also make this less, um, what's the word? To, to automate it more. Um, so what we usually have is, I'm going to go to my Outlook. Let me just share and show you that you can have the template that we just um, shown you uh, as a signature so that when you send an invite, um, you already have, you know, the, 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 the meeting ready. So the best way to do this is to go to files, and go to options. Um, yeah, my screen is showing. Uh, go to options and then you go to tasks. Advanced, advanced, sorry, advanced. 
I'll also show you a quick way of doing this as well. And then sorry, it's not as smooth as I wanted. Um, let's just start from scratch. File, options, mail, signatures, and oh, I already have it, but I'll show you how to add a new one. So you can just set new, so I can say Oprah agenda. And then you say, okay. And then you go to somewhere where you have uh, already have the table ready. And then you copy that table and then you paste it in down here. So basically um, it will have, we just add a title because different meetings will have different titles. And then it has all that outcome purpose even have a space for people that you need to invite and where, you know, these are the, just the others part of planning. And then it has a slot for, you know, what the topic that you're going to be um, discussing and the desired results being the main uh, thing there. And then the approach and then preparation, you know, who's going to be leading it and sort of what the time allocated is. And then you just say, okay. And you say okay here and then every time then you say you want a new meeting um, then you can add it as from insert you find it is it not showing Hold on. my screen is not showing anymore let me just show you as well so I, all i did was just start a new meeting There we go. So I just started a new meeting and then you just go to insert and then you go look for your um, signature and there it is. And then it comes down there and then you can populate it and then send out the meeting with um, the populated already with the details, a detailed agenda. So I'm going to just stop sharing and do this in Word as we run the issue before I do that. There's another trick that I use. Just if you want to add something. Um, so another easy way to just add a signature is go to new. open a new um, document, whether it's an email or a, or a invite. And then under signature here, there's another thing that says signature and you do have an opportunity to just say create a new one. So basically the same thing without going to settings. Okay, so let me just say cancel because we already had created that and Actually, we can just populate it here. Let's see if that can work. There we go. Yeah, I think that's visible enough. We'll just scroll down as we need to. Okay, so do you guys remember the scenario that we're doing? We, um, I'm gonna need you guys to be very interactive because I'm gonna need uh, everybody to just be a part of this as we populate uh, the agenda for this meeting that we're gonna have regarding our child's performance in school. Okay, where do we, where do we begin? Should we begin with the, the title? How can we say what we're going to do? How can we say, um, how can we title what we're about to do? Anyone? Camilla? Student performance discussion. Okay.
let's see another common discussion on a child's performance. I think, yeah, those they do uh, say about the same thing. And then outcome, you know, what do we want to see? Um, what, what would we regard as success at the end of this meeting that we are planning? What are the ideal end results that we want to see at the end of the meeting? Okay, Camilla. <laughs> so the, the awareness for the parent, as well as a plan to improve the student's performance. Okay, so awareness of the parent, as well as the tools that are going to be used to assist the child. Yes. Okay. The plan, sorry, I, I, I kind of feel like I was confusing them because I see there's actually a chat that says what tools are going to be used to assist the child. So I guess we can bring them together and say awareness. If there's any other, you can just uh, let us know if there's anything additional. Awareness, um, parent. Uh, Plan and tools to help the child. So it's important that uh, when you think of your outcome, it should be tangible. Mm. So something like this, so what, a plan mm -hmm. with tools is a mm. tangible result. A list of outcomes or ideas is something tangible. So. Mm. Just think about that when you think about outcomes, yeah. something that you can actually like look at and say, yeah. yes, we've done that. So at the end, it should be easy to tell whether you achieved what you set out to do or not. You know, so, so far for the th three things that we have here, at the end, we want a parent to be aware of the child's performance. And we want there to be a plan and tools that will help the child um, I'm assuming improve their performance. I don't know if I missed it or I'll just I'll just add it there in case I missed it. And why? Why is this important to us? Why do we want to do this? Okay, now Google says for the student to excel, Nasli says to assist the child. Do we wanna combine them, bring them together? As to what is our primary why? What is the main why we are doing this? I will just combine the two of them the way they are. So it's for us to, maybe the root of a problem. So, yeah, I think um, understanding the root, root of the problem would probably be seen more of as, um, I mean, I guess it could be both an outcome and a purpose, depending. So when you say, yeah, but it's, it's a. So I think I'd say, uh, Nancy, your point about maybe to get to the root of the problem could be something we could add in our desired results, mm. perhaps. So that's something that the teacher could help us with by explaining like what exactly has been going mm. on with, with the child. Um, yeah, so I think we could use the, the other point. The other three points, yeah. yeah. So I completely agree, Nazli. The point is sort of uh, might be in addition to that awareness of the parent. That they don't just get awareness, but they also understand what the root problem is. So it could just sort of be like a, a, a deeper delving into... Um, 
the, the outcome, the, the thing that we want to see. On the purpose, I think I will, I will summarize the three that I've seen there. So that will be uh, to assist the child to improve and excel. I think those three are, can be encompassed in that. Now, who do you think we should invite to this? Who do you think needs to be present? So the teacher and parents, so parents, teacher, maybe headmaster, uh, it's happy. Yeah. And the child. And the child, okay. School psychologist if needed, guidance counselor, um, these are all very good um, people that could be, you know, part of um, the solution. And I think headmaster and HOD will take it as the same thing. And psychologist, psychologist, I'm missing psychologist. Okay. So I think, oh, and someone says maybe the child as well, right? So I will add that and child. Um, and okay, venue, we'll just say at the school um, and then the appropriate date and time. So we will just skip that. Um, and then uh, Gia says uh, classmates, just so, so not to ignore it. What do you guys, uh, what's your take on having classmates uh, there to a meeting about a child not performing. Sam? I don't think so. It might make the child feel embarrassed. Mm. Oh, sorry, yeah, it's not you. <laughs> sorry, um, I don't know who said, yeah. Um, I, I completely agree as well, remember, because the one thing we, we want is that everybody who's there to be free, to be in a safe space so that they are comfortable to participate. And um, having a child there might not, having other kids there might not necessarily be conducive for the child in question. And also you have to think about what they will be offering in terms of the participation in the meeting. As we've said, we don't want, you know, um, vacationers and people that don't know why they're there. Uh, let's see, Zuleika. Anything you wanted to add? If you are speaking, please unmute yourself. For that, you don't want to intimidate the child. The whole thing here is you might push the child over the edge. Mm. Consult with the teacher, the principal, and the child and the parent. Mm -hmm. This is the problem. Why is there a problem? Is there anything troubling? You're not understanding and find a way forward and see how that process works. If it doesn't work, then move over to getting psychologists, etc. In Okay. Yes, because it doesn't also necessarily need to be a single uh, stage approach. You know, you could have a separate meeting with a child only if, you know, one feels like the conversation might be, uh, you know, maybe not for the right one for their age and things like that. But if you feel comfortable, you know, it's the right age, they have sufficient understanding and, you know, they can uh, 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 receive and um, participate in a manner that is free, then you definitely can. Camilla? Yes, I think for the purpose of this meeting, it would probably be the teacher and the parents um, to create the awareness understand you know the mm. root cause from the teacher and and the parents and then moving forward um involve the, the student to implement yeah. 
tools and yes so thank you but I, I will not change it at this point i think ultimately you get the idea is that you're thinking about why you're doing it and who needs to be there and why they are relevant so that will change depending on the different scenarios that you'll choose so for now well, let's go to you know uh the items topic mostly looking at what results do we want to achieve so we know the outcome we have in mind. How, what, what actions can we take to achieve those? So what will we need to be doing? What will be the content of the meeting? Okay, so I think firstly would be a discussion like between the teachers and the parents just to find out how did the child do in relation to how did the grade do because okay. I think that gives you a direction in terms of is the issue with the child or could there be something else that could be done mm. um, before you know uh, so I think that's just to measure like the performance like um, okay. of the, yeah so you say via discussion what kind of preparation would we need for this um, I would say, uh, I don't know if it would have to be a meeting between the parents and the teachers, but I think the reports, reports report. should be there. Yeah, so I think reports would be, okay. would be the and best. And who would thing. be leading this section? That would be the, the headmaster, I think, the HOD of that particular department or that particular grade. Okay. I think they can provide reports for the whole grade. Mm. Okay, so you think HOD would be relevant? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and then any other actions that will lead us to our outcomes that we need to take? How, so, uh, how would we get to the root problem or get the plans? Yeah, how do we get to the root cause? Uh, because root cause is outcome. What actions will we need to take to get to it? Okay, so the second thing, <laughs> um, I think it would now move to, once we've determined like the grades then the behavior, the child's behavior mm -hmm. in class, um, mm. are they doing their homeworks and mm. then I think this would be also another discussion but with the teacher mm. um, and then yeah I think preparation would just be the like the teacher just telling us like you know how's the child doing but again I think the parents could be part of this discussion and then they will give like insights on how the child is behaving at home. Yeah, okay. So it could be both in terms of, you know, just noting, like looking back at, you know, recent uh, interactions. Yes. Or thinking back on, yeah, so. So I'm gonna leave it here now because just for time's sake, However, I'm hoping that it is sort of clear at the questions that I'm asking us to say, you know, the items that we're discussing have to relate to the outcome that we have already stated that this is what we achieved. So your meeting then must, um, the items that are in your meetings then must speak to um, the outcome. In that way, then we will have, you know, grade analysis and behavior analysis. So we'll speak to get, you know, first aid information and data from the people that are, you know, uh, key in this um, child's life around school and life that could impact school to tell us, you know, what's happening so that you can get a clear and um, more informed um, uh, analysis as well as and feedback as to how this child is doing and of course you could go on and estimate you know how long each discussion could take and then at the end of the day then you will know the times that your meetings will set and if it looks like you know these discussions might take a lot of time then that could be an opportunity to say you know do I need to have two meetings for this 
you know, um, knowing on average how uh, available your people are, you know, so most people are never available for more than two hours for one meeting. So looking into those things. So this is the planning. This is the thinking. These are the questions that you need to be asking as you're doing that plan, you know, thinking about what you want to achieve at the end and who needs to be there and what kind of actions need to be taken. Um, any, any last thoughts before we move on? Okay, so it's not mainly like on the content of this discussion, but I just want to check like in terms of approach, right? I see here we just uh, highlighted discussion, like what are other approaches, like approach methods or mechanisms mm. that can be applied or that can be, you know, highlighted? Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean... Uh, let's just actually just go to grades as well as much as it might be kind of like a discussion you could even say it's a presentation because maybe you know you want to show percentages of kids above them and those are around lower than them you want to check it and show this was first term second term third term whether it's been a deteriorating performance so that would be like a presentation um, and you could also, yeah, like you could, if, if let's say when we get to plans and tools to improve the child, then we could say, let's brainstorm ideas that we think based on the problems that we have now discussed and understand, what do we think are the plan, the tools and the relevant plans that we can put forward for, uh, the child to, 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 to go on with, and hopefully that will improve their their performance going forward. So it can be a few things. Um, so it can be something, yes, that's just like, you know, with behavior analysis, asking someone on the field, you know, what happened? Why did that break down? You know, when did it break down? What did you see before that? So sometimes it's that asking people who have experienced it, someone who worked with it, someone on the floor shop to tell you their firsthand experience. You can corroborate that with data, go to data. If there's any skater collecting information, you collect it, you see, okay, sort of this where the times, and this is what these people saw, and this is what happened. So you can already understand sort of like the impact that whatever incident had. And in that case, then if you are then going to root cause analysis, then you can also know, okay, we know the, the outcomes, the impact it had. Can we now think of what could have caused that? Um, and then you have like collected multiple information from different sources that will ultimately um, reach you to that. Then once you have the root cause, then you say solutions, you know, and then solutions could be like, you know, they could be brainstorm. And then after that, then you can do some form of, you know, multi-voting, voting and saying agreeing on the best implementation uh, options, uh, solutions to implement that could potentially fix the problem. And then your outcome could have been like, you know, what do we, what kind of actions or solutions to fix that problem? And that would have been maybe your outcome. And then all these actions would then be what it would take to get there. Okay. Is that good with everybody? So I think just in closing, I would say it just takes you asking a lot of questions uh, around, you know, why you're doing something, how it's relevant, how it relates to your outcome, um, and how also your outcome relates to your overall objective or, you know, relevance to the work that you do. All right, so the last section, Connie will take us through intervention. Uh, for disruptive behavior. Thank you, Nicole. Um, just to add one last point with regards to meeting planning. Um, planning an, ag an agenda does take some time. So just keep that in mind. It's not supposed to be quick. It, you're supposed to deliberately spend some time thinking about what goes into it, like Nicole said, all the questions you ask yourself. You need to sit down, think about it. It might, if your meeting is... 30 minutes long, it might take you an hour thinking through the agenda beforehand so you have everything prepped. So, yeah. And now we'll move on to interventions. So we'll just be talking about um, 
how you can manage any disruptive behavior you experience during your meetings. So just to start it out, I'm going to ask you all, what are some examples of disruptive behaviors you've observed in meetings? So this is either in the digital environment or in the physical environment. Yes, Kelly. Um, so yeah, for me, an example that say, say you, you have the agenda set up and every item has its time and then say you've, you've settled an, or, uh, a discussion on say item number two and then you get to item number five and then someone wants to go back to item number two and you know, it, it, yeah, just to go back. So back and forth thing essentially from the agenda. Yep, that's very disruptive because you won't finish the meeting. I mean, you just keep going back in circles. So that's very disruptive. Um, anyone else? What else have you observed in your meetings? Yes, Sam? People speaking over each other and not giving each other a turn to complete what they want to say. Yep. Um, Keva? Yeah, it's almost the something that interjecting while it's, someone is still speaking as there's not finished whatever he or she is presenting. Exactly. So those are those are all good examples. Um, if if you have any more, you can just send them through in the chat while we continue. So yeah, so people speaking over each other, interjecting, maybe going around in circles when an agenda has already been set. That's very disruptive. So. Um, here are some te techniques, but before we go into techniques, um, there's some questions you need to ask yourself as a facilitator before you decide whether or not to intervene. So the first thing is deciding whether or not an intervention is required. Um, so it depends on what's happening, whatever you're encountering, you need to discern, like, should I interject? Should I just let it be? Is it something that's going to take over the meeting? And how you decide this is going back to your agenda. If I let this um, disruption continue, will I still achieve my outcome or um, the goals that we've set for the meeting? And then the second thing you need to ask is what level of intervention is most appropriate for, for what you're doing? So for example, in this digital environment, if I need to intervene, I could ask myself, is it okay if I just like privately message the person and ask them um, to stop what they're doing? Or is it something that needs to be addressed um, after the meeting, if it's something that was quite big or sensitive? Or is it something that I can just address like in the meeting? So if someone's audio is on, for example, and it's disrupting everyone, it's as easy as just asking that person, oh, sorry, could you please like just um, mute yourself? Um, so you just need to understand the level of intervention that you need. In a physical environment, it's also similar. So if you have someone who's dominating and controlling the meeting, um, you could ask them to step aside with you for a minute just to talk to them. Or if it's something that's subtle, um, you could use more subtle intervention tools, which I'll go through just now. Um, yeah, so I also basically covered the third point. So when and where should the intervention occur? Should it happen in the session? or should it happen outside of the session? So these are the things that you need to, to think about um, before you decide whether or not to intervene. So the intervention levels that range from low level to high level. So these are just some of um, the examples that you'll encounter. Um, so some of these work in the physical environment only, and some you might be able to use also in the digital environment. So. You can change your position and proximity or posture if you are in a room with people and you see some disruptive behavior. So if you see some chatter happening at one table, um, you could subtly walk towards that table. And what tends to happen is that people just naturally tend to start talking because they feel a bit uncomfortable with you being right there and they feel that they can't continue with the small chatter. Um, another tool that you can use as a facilitator is silence. So again, if you just go silent, people then tend to wonder, oh, what's happening? Why is this person silent? So that silence can cause people to just um, get back to the program. Um, another thing you could use is observe, state, and question. So 
if, for example, like again, if people are talking, you see a lot of discussion happening, it could be that people are unclear on something. So you could ask the general group, um, is there anything that you need clarity on? Um, do you need us to explain anything further or do you need me to explain anything further? So that's something else that you can use. I um, mean, this is also powerful because you can use this both physically or digitally. The other thing is stressing specific words or clarifying specific words. So if I emphasize, think very carefully, if I emphasize the word think, I'm trying to emphasize that you need to think about something. So depends on what you're saying, you can stress, clarify words. Um, if disruptive behavior is really messing up with the schedule of your program, you can then take a break as well, because sometimes it might be that people are getting a bit restless in a session. Um, you can see that people are getting agitated. It might be that they just need a small break just to do something else, leg stretch maybe, and then come back to the session. Um, and then you can also be all in discussion. So if, um, if needs be, you can just see if you need to discuss something with the whole group. Um, so for example, if you are deciding on outcomes for a strategy and people are talking, and it seems like people aren't even ready to get to a strategy point, you might just ask, what exactly is bothering people? They might feel that um, they haven't really um, discussed enough what needs to happen in the meeting. So you need to maybe take a step back. The other tool that you can use is ask participants to mute themselves. Um, so I already covered this. So if people or someone's um, mic is unmuted and you can hear some background noise, you as a facilitator can mute them or you can ask them to mute themselves. Um, another thing is asking participants to turn their video on. So earlier, Tepi was telling us about her great experience with facilitator. When your camera is on, everyone can see what you're doing. So you tend to be paying more attention, you're more focused, less disruptive, um, less things are likely to go wrong. Um, you can reiterate agreements to agenda or the process. So again, um, the agenda is quite a powerful tool, tool to use with intervention because like um, Clever mentioned, when people are going off topic, you can just direct them back to the agenda that you've, you've, you've done. So remember, this is what we need to cover. This is what's on the agenda. Maybe let's put that in the parking lot so that you move on with the program. Um, the other thing you can do is refer to desired outcomes. So again, it's similar to referring to the agenda or re reiterating agreement. And then reinforcing ground rules is another big thing that you can use. So if we've agreed that phones are on silence, if someone's phone is constantly beeping or ringing, you can always direct them back to the agenda and say, oh, look, listen, we've agreed that um, our phones are going to be silent for this session. So please can we just remember to keep our phones on silent. If you need to take a call, just step outside. And then another one you can use, which is quite subtle is eye contact. Eye contact. So this works very well physically, obviously not so much digitally. Um, when you're in a room and you just subtly, not in a scary way, just give eye contact to someone who's maybe causing direct, um, disruptive behavior, maybe talking too much, you can just give them a bit of eye contact and they tend to stop the disruptive behavior. Again, you can ask some questions, which is always a good tool. And boomerang. Boomerang is basically if, um, if someone asks you a question as a facilitator, you can ask the broader group to answer the question, see what they think. And that also tends to help in your sessions. Yeah, so these are a lot of the, the intervention methods that you can use. Some are subtle, some are more um, direct. Are there any questions or comments or any on any of these? Okay, um, if there are no questions, then I'll move on to some quick facilitation tips that you can use in any of the sessions you'll have in the future. So again, some of these work digitally, some of these only work in the physical environment. 
So if you are preparing for a session or a meeting, as a facilitator, you need to be very well prepared. So along with having a very detailed agenda, you need to make sure that everything else that you need to use is already set up and ready for you. So tabs, so if you're using flip charts, you can use um, tab marks or sticky notes to quickly write down your notes and stick them on the flip chart. Um, you should avoid using light colors and reds um, when you're writing on a flip chart and, and red sometimes in the digital environment. You should use titles or headings. So this helps people understand what exactly is happening on that page. So make sure your titles and headings are prepped beforehand. Again, using bold letters, um, using alternate colors for separate ideas. So you'll see that we did that with the meeting challenges that we did before. We had alternating um, colors for each of the, the ideas that were brought, brought to us. You can use colors for highlighting and underlining. Um, you can use pre-masking tape. So if you're in a room that doesn't have flip charts, but you're using a wall, you can just make sure that you've pre-pasted your, your flip charts or paper onto the wall and mask them there. Um, you can use diagrams and flow charts. So make sure you've pre-drawn your, your flow charts or diagrams if you need to. Um, and again, as a facilitator, if you're standing in front of a group of people, avoid looking at the flip chart, then you have your back towards the people. Um, this will obviously not let them hear you as audibly as they should. So avoid looking at the flip chart and talking to the flip chart, have your flip charts prepared and use post-it notes. We use post-it notes a lot in, in the physical uh, world. So this is also a good thing to use. And using pencil, so if you're a facilitator and you know that you need to draw a little diagram that you'd have to draw live, it helps to like just pre-draw it with the pencil lightly so that when you get to it, um, you remember exactly what you need to do. So yeah, these are just some tips and tricks that you can use as a facilitator. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, if not, then I'll give it back to Mpo to round up the session. Okay. Um, so we have come to the end of the session. Um, so before we go, I just thought that we um, ask you to go one last time into Menti and just share your experience today as to, you know, what mostly stood out for you um, and what are the key takeaways from the session today. Um, you're free to also just discuss with them here live, um, but we like to have a nice word cloud. So we also show you another way Menti can be used. You can create a word cloud so you will see as the results come up. Can you share it as well? Um, so they can see the code and the answers. So yeah, you'll see a word cloud. You will see another way this tool can be used on the digital. You see like practical examples. Also when you're doing like surveys and things like that and you have that, it can show you the predominant theme that the group has. Um, it's sort of like a great tool when you don't have like any, it doesn't require any additional subscriptions and things like that. So the digital, but of course there are options as well on Zoom to do Q and A's and polls and things like that that you might need to preset. So these are just some ideas that to use in terms of tools that will can keep a, um, session interactive and people engaged, especially as we work a lot from home now. And a few people have been, you know, saying that people sometimes are not fully there. So this is one way you could just say, listen, let me get your feedback. Um, you know, what are your key concern about this particular thing that we are, we're talking about and, and things like that. Um, when we do the other, the next week's session as well, you will see that we will use another app um, that can help collate ideas um, and also enc encourages collaboration as well, especially when you're looking to brainstorm instead of just 
uh, engagement and things. Can we get more answers? I only see fee for responses. I see people saying they took away, like, you know, what did you learn personally today? You know, someone saying the agenda, Oprah, what are the key things that you think going forward? You know, I think I'm going to implement this. I really like that. Um, what are the key things that stood out for you from this session? Just reflection. Reflection is also part of learning. Going back is like almost searching the memory of what, you know, information that just got created. It is actually part of um, reinforcing something that you've just learned. So it is good to uh, reflect, um, summarize, you know, your learning at the end. You know, we used to do that when we were studying. At the end of the day, you go back and, you know, just highlight the key things that stood out for you. It reinforces the key things that you're going to take away and it does uh, instill, you know, learning deeper. Any other, any other, anyone else? Um, but I think these are great takeaway planning, planning, planning and practice, practice, practice. I think those are the two things that we are, yeah, uh, thanks for those additional um inputs that the key thing is that you know it, it planning is essential and most of the meetings that we go to people do tend to just rock up also because we are too comfortable sometimes with what we do on a routine that we don't go back and do that what we called we already just in conscious competence so don't go back and do reflective as to how do we do something different how do we improve um so Thank you so much for those uh, input. And just as a final kind of like goodbye thing, I will <laughs> give you a challenge uh, to say um, in your, where is it? There's my challenge. And, in, in, you know, as you go back um, to your, there we go. As you go back, you know, to your life and whether you are going to be leading or assisting to lead a meeting, go there and um, you develop a, an agenda with the, using the planning process steps that we showed, um, having, you know, the Oprah framework as, as we have shown you and review the agenda with someone in your team and then you know distribute it and then facilitate the meeting and run the meeting and see how it goes you know as your own challenge to yourself and as further practice because we do believe that you know they say you literally retain less than 10 percent from hearing um and then a little bit more when it's demonstrated but way more when you are actually doing yourself it's over 90 percent when you actually start doing it yourself so how do you guys like that? Um, and just in closing, I, you know, to just bring together everything is that what we normally teach here is that as an operation, you usually have somewhere on the performance S curve where you could be. Uh, you know, some companies uh, could be, you know, more lower down there where they are more effort driven by individuals, where you have a few individuals that really know the work and they are the heroes. And, you know, if they are not involved, nothing happens, everything falls down because there are no systems and things like that. And what we usually see is that once you introduce facilitation as a skill to business improvement, is that facilitation is that ability to use the knowledge that already exists in, in the organization and actually formalize it. And in that way, you are able to move up your performance curve because you are able to problem solve and together as a group, you are able to solve this, you know, lower hanging fruit that are impeding your performance. Now, we run more modules that will then turn into more uh, lean and Six Sigma, lean, we call it flow, system flow to say, okay, now we have done all we can using just the team's knowledge, you know, can we have systematic tools to increase flow? 
And then once we have done that, to say, okay, uh, do we want to take it a step further and do an advanced analysis, you know, or look at vari variability and say, we want to not have super bad days and super good days. We just want to exist as close as possible within the limits of our system uh, that we have set for ourselves. And you do that through statistical analysis and some data uh, that um, data analysis through some Lean Six Sigma tools to reduce your variability. And after that, then it's more predictive things that are detailed statistical analysis and advanced analysis. Uh, so these are all sort of available. So if you're trying to uh, find you know, a position for where facilitation helps in um, change management and in business improvement. It actually is one of those fundamental things because you can, without spending any money, you know, be able to bring change, bring improvement in your performance, save money from spending too much time in meetings and actually have meetings that have impacts without wasting time uh, with ineffective and unproductive meetings like it is the beginning of uh, performance improvement and we hope that you enjoyed it and that you will join us for more tools uh, next month and the month after that thank you thank you everybody um, Okay, thank you, everyone. All right, thanks, Bunny, thanks Nicole. Bye bye. 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 bye.